Stefan. How are you doing, Johnny? I'm good. You look very black and white. It's very film noir. I mean, I love the shadows behind you. So how are you? I'm very well, working very hard right now on a 500 page book, the first philo comprehensive philosophical treatment on transhumanism. So oh, wonderful. Well, well then, 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 then you, you're exactly the person we should be speaking to. So tell me, so tell me how you first got into transhumanism and when, when was that first on your, well, tell me a little bit about you. Go on, introduce yourself. Tell me who you are. Give me okay. sort of your, how you define yourself really. I'm a philosophy professor here working based in Rome, a tenured philosophy professor at John Cabot University in Rome. And I've been dealing with transhumanism now for, for about, you know, 20 years professionally. Um, originally, sort of my background was very much sort of that Nietzschean German philosophy. And then eventually I, I, I realized that there is a close connection between sort of um, the, my interest in bioethical issues and medical ethical issues and in, in issues concerning ethics of emerging technologies and, and sort of the Nietzschean philosophical background I've had. And um, I, I closely cooperated with the Future of Humanity Institutes. I was based in, in, at the University of Jena at that time. Um, and eventually in 2007, I think, um, Jena and Oxford um, organized a conference on gene ethics together. So that was, um, well, the Department of Philosophy or well, the Department of Applied Ethics in Jena together with the, um, the Uhiro Center of Applied Ethics at the University of Oxford. And there was Julian Savolescu, who is a close friend of mine. There was Nick Bostrom, there is Anders Sandberg. And you know many many other people from um, they were coming over to Jena, and so we exchanged um, um, at that event. Actually, I gave I gave a presentation on the connection between Nietzsche and transhumanism, which was later on published in the Journal of Evolution and Technology in 2009. And 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 this is one of the most cited articles on Nietzsche ever, and that oh. actually deals with Nietzsche and transhumanism and the connection. And as a consequence. Um, uh, people responded to that art article one and one of the first responses came from Max Moore whom you've also interviewed as I've seen so he he, he wrote in response to my article and he even I said Nietzsche and transhumanism there's a structural analogy between their ways of thinking Max Moore himself stressed um, it's not only a structurally analogous way of thinking but he himself was influenced strongly influenced by Nietzsche so there is a strong Nietzschean connection in contrast to what Nick Bostrom suggested because he said no I don't want to have anything to do with Nietzsche Nietzsche is a bad guy we don't want to get you know <laughs> um, and and and, and then since 2009 I actually organized an annual conference series on um, on on trends and posthumanism um, in a different country every year. I, I, I'm running several book series. At the, at the conference series, I mean, there were people from, uh, yeah, Natasha gave the talk, Natasha Vita Moore. We've had, we've had Julian Savolesco. We've had people like, you know, artists like Stellark. Um, Martin Rosblad, she gave a talk at these events. And Martin Rosblad is a close friend of mine too. Um, she was, because eventually I, I developed also the approach combining a more continental way of thinking and, and, and transhumanist approach called metahumanism and, and Martin Rosblatt, um, you, you know her obviously. Yeah, yeah, you? yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, but let me ask you just because I actually, feel like- she recently, she recently um, embraced metahumanism and just this year she published an article on metahumanism embracing uh, my approach and she came to visit me here in Rome as well. And so since then, and in 2017, maybe one more thing, in 2017, I, I launched the first academic journal explicitly dedicated to the post-human, which is a journal of post-human studies. It's the first academic double-blind peer-reviewed journal, and that's coming, on, uh, coming out online and in print with, in cooperation with um, the university, uh, Penn State University Press. And later this year, one of my books, one of my books, is, which is entitled On Transhumanism, will be, because most of them have been published in German. Um, but this book will be coming out in English translation with Penn State University Press as well. Well, let's define our terms. I think, I think terms are really important. I think, we, 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 I think part of what I certainly think is part of 
wherever we're going and however we're going to get there, we're redefining terms. We're redefining how we live. So it, it, to me, any which way you look at it, we are in a process and we've been in a process throughout our existence of, of redefinition. So I think it's really useful, especially if we're having these conversations, to sort of talk about our terms. You've thrown out a lot of terms. I'd like, if you can, in the most concise way, define each of these and tell me how. So we've got terms like transhumanism, very basic, posthumanism, and there's three others that, that I'm perhaps going to get wrong, so I'm not going to try and remember. But there, there's a bunch of terms that you've used to describe your um, I guess narrative, your, your trajectory. So tell me about those, because I think we can have a much more useful discussion if we, we're on the same page as far as our, our, our terms. I, well, let me, let me put it in the form of one simple question. I mean, do you define yourself as a trans? I know you define yourself as a philosopher and you are obviously concerned with the future. Do you define yourself as a transhuman and what does that mean? And then tell me about some of these other different terms that you've used and what they mean to you. Yes, I, 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 uh, I, I am being referred to and I, I regard myself as a transhumanist, yes, as a special, I do have a special take on transhumanism in contrast to most of, of the other transhumans that actually my thinking has been strongly influenced by continental uh, philosophical approaches like, like Nietzsche's approach. So it's a further development of, of the Nietzschean way of thinking application to emerging technologies. Um, sort of what I'm doing, uh, what I'm particularly interested in is, is developing a complex philosophical approach concerning transhumanism. Because so far, I mean, there have been transhumanist philosophers, obviously. Um, what, so just before, before you launch, yeah. what, is what does it mean to be a transhumanist? When you say I'm a transhumanist, I have a slightly different take. But let me, what, so what does it mean that makes, that, that you feel comfortable enough to say I am this? You know, so tell me that first. Exactly. No, that's very important. Yeah. Um, uh, so what I regard actually as the core of transhumanist uh, approaches is a positivity concerning emerging technologies because they increase the likelihood of people living a good life. I think that's the very core of all the transhumanist approaches. And um, by doing so, by using these emerging technologies, we can break away from the current limitations of us as, as persons. And by transcending these limitations, um, we, 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 um, it is possible for us to develop capacities which increase the, our likelihood of living good lives. And that's what we are all interested in in the end. So yeah. these things that limit us, I mean, so, I mean, I can obviously recount some of the things. What are they and how, and what are the emerging technologies that are gonna allow us to uh, transcend these limitations. Okay, so there's a wide range of different technologies which enable us to transcend the boundaries of us as, as in, in our current state of being. Um, the most efficient, the most promising technologies at the moment are digital technologies and the wide range of gene technologies. So, and um, the most the most extreme form of transhumanism is the one which has in mind sort of the mind uploading as a goal. However, I don't think this is one has to affirm mind uploading in order to be a transhumanist. It's just about the use of technologies, the positivity concerning the use of emerging technologies in order to break away from the current uh, limitations and transcend these limitations in a significant way. Um, so mind uploading would be the most extreme thing. The next thing which I regard as more promising for the time being is that chips wander inside our body. We develop further as cyborgs. What Elon Musk is doing with his Neuralink is extremely fascinating. I, I think extremely groundbreaking. And the third um, field which is, which is extremely promising is sort of the wide range of gene, gene editing technologies selecting genes after in vitro fertilization and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, uh, gene printing. So it's, it's the entire range of gene technologies. And in particular, when, when both of these fields come together, sort of the intersection between gene analysis and, and sort of by means of digital technologies, by using big data analysis for analyzing our genes in order to get a better understanding what we can do with genes. This, is, this, is, this has the greatest potential for radically changing 
who we are in the, in the, in the forthcoming decades, I think. My sense is, and it's funny that you went straight for the jugular in, in, in terms of our limitations, because you know, it's mind uploading to me, obviously the biggest or a <laughs> fundamental limitation is our um, finite um, time on, on planet Earth right now um, because of aging. So, you know, we've spoken to many gerontologists. I always pronounce that wrong. And yesterday we, we, we spoke to Anders, who I, I love because he's so, he's so jolly. He's the most jolly, Swedish, <laughs> clever person I've ever met. It's wonderful. So that was, that was fun. So we, you went straight to these big, the big ones, which is death. And then you sort of yes. dialed back a bit. And I want to talk to you about those particular things. But in terms of dialing back, you also went for the ones that, in a way, are the most salacious. Because we immediately dive into ethical issues or bioethical issues. And I guess the big one, and I guess we should talk about this because it's so prevalent, is here we are living in a global pandemic. And I, you know, I know we, sh in my view, we should have learned various lessons from, you know, as far back as the Spanish flu, but, but, but even, even more recently. And we haven't, and why not? But, but given, given that we are living in this pandemic where, you know, that the, there is this debate about whether we should give up privacy. As I've seen the protests, there are many, many young people who do suddenly seem so concerned with this idea of, you know, we're gonna put our um, genetic information and our health information in the hands of big corporations and, and so on. And yet, that in the macro, it doesn't, it seems like there are fixes, but I don't wanna get bogged down in the, in, in the weeds. I, I guess the question, the, the question is, um, here we are living in this, and what do you think of these discussions around these ethical issues, which are as, as simple as, you know, do we you know, allow ourselves to be part of a, a, a trace system that can help at least curb some of the aspects of this pandemic? Exactly, I mean, this is exactly what I was interviewed on. I sent you the interview, or, or, or your assistant the interview uh, a couple of days ago, I, I was on the cover of the magazine, of the Immortalist magazine, and a detailed 10-page interview on, on these issues, on how health and privacy are related, um, are covered in that in interview, um, which came out in April, in the April-May issue of the Immortalist magazine. And there okay. I, I, I took a clear stance, actually. Um, and and the, situa the situation is even worse concerning, concerning sort of the European take. In Europe, they're even more concerned with privacy issues than it's the case in, in, in the US. Because here, basically, the possibility of collecting digital data is undermined on a legal basis. It's not properly possible for any government um, or any other institution to collect as many uh, digital data as necessary for, for doing something um, against the pandemic or for doing something in favor for increasing our health span. So um, I think the European, uh, the European solution is not even in the European interest. Um, in, in the US, it's, uh, there's at least the possibility of, of you know, the big companies uh, of co collecting the data or the government. And then obviously we've got a, a third take on these issues, which is represented by China, because in China it's basically the political solution. Here we've got the government forcing everyone to give up the digital data, and they in that way have the possibility of collecting as much data as possible. And so far actually, um, this is quite efficient. It, it works pretty well. Um, and so I think... Can I interrupt you just there? Because yeah. I mean, it's odd to me in some ways, the most efficient system is the least free system, is a system where, where one is forced to give this up, you know, for the state. And look, to me, in some ways, in some ways, as, a, as you know, from a pragmatic perspective, that's great. Like, again, but there is also, one has to have a trust in the systems or in the, the institution that one is giving one's data. It's me, I'm giving me, you know, to, 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 these, to these people, or at least parts of me. And so one has to trust that, that that's going to be used in, 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 a, in a way that's not just beneficent to the state, I don't know, is beneficent the right word, helpful to the state, exactly. but, but also helpful to, to, to me as the individual. It's that, I mean, that's really, to me, if we had to sort of take it to its core, it's how do we balance 
helping society as a whole and and retaining my own individual freedom. I mean, that's really what it boils down to. And I'm sure there's a great Nietzsche quote around around this that I'm going to put you on the spot for as a, as a Nietzsche expert. This is really spot on the analysis. And um, but we have to also recognize that at the same time, the, the American US American way of dealing with that issue is not in the interest of the users either. It's in, in the interest of the big companies, because in the end, they are making the money with the digital data they are collecting. So we've got the US solution where the companies are getting richer. And we've got the, the, the Chinese solution where it's basically the government who's, who's having the benefits out of the collecting of the data. And that's why I think, and that's very much in tune also with, with, with a lot of things FM um, 2030 was concerned. We need to find sort of a, a democratic way of dealing with the digital data. We have to make sure that it's, it's in our interest. It's in, in the interest of the people that we have the benefits of the data collection. Uh, yeah, I don't think that F I think FM really did think of these things practically. I, I you know, and he made many statements that sound cavalier or sound, you know, not thought out. And I think, yes, we do need this. The question is, how do we get there? I mean, I don't know that's not necessarily a question for, for, for the philosophers, philosophers amongst us. But to me, as somebody with children and, and, and so on, who, who wants a better future for, for everybody, and myself and my, my children, you know, but also the planet. So how, the question is, you know, how do we get there? That we have all these problems and to, I think FM probably would have thought that, that, that we would trust some sort of AI, you know, to sort of both manage this, but also have sort of you know, the right programming that was going to, you know, is it, you know, make it the information as utilitarian as possible, I, th I think. But I mean, how feasible is something like that today? I, I don't, it doesn't seem that feasible right now. Well, the, this sort of depends upon the, the political arrangement, but I think we radically need to rethink a lot of our prejudices. And I pick, particularly want to focus on something you've said. Well, once we give up our privacy, we lose our freedom. No, I, I didn't say that. I don't think I said that. I, I, think, that, uh, I think people <laughs> believe that. Okay, I don't think okay. I said that. <laughs> At least you hinted at sort of. Well, I think that, I think that's. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I th and I yeah. think that is the feeling. I don't necessarily think that's okay. true, but it's only not true if whoever we're giving is, in your analogy, China, America. Yeah, you know, and and you know that that is there. Can we? Is there a me an intermediate balance where it's not being? put in the hands of a state that doesn't really care about the individual but cares about the state or the companies that only care about the bottom line. We need something else that somehow just skirts both of those things, right? Exactly. And I want to show, no, um, there doesn't have to be a conflict between freedom and, and, and the loss of privacy because it depends on the political organization um, whether there's a conflict or not. If, it's, if, it's, if the digital data is used as in China, then there is a problem because the people get sanctioned for what they're doing, for whatever they're doing. And the, and the limitations and the rules are extremely rigid. And so what we have to do, there are two theories which have to do why we cherish privacy. So one of the theories is the sanction theory and the other theory of privacy is the intellectual property theory. So if we wanna make sure that digital data which the, the, the government, and the government is the most likely, the most efficient institution which can collect all the data. Um, if, 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 if we can make sure that the intellectual property is not being taken away, but is you being used as a, as, a, as, a, as a way that we sell with our intellectual property, we, we buy something which is in our interest. So, it's not the state taking away our intellectual property, but the money which is being made with that information is being used for something which is in our interest, like I mean, a, what, what like a health about? insurance, like a general, uh, like, a, um, like a public health insurance. Most people identify a longer health span with a better quality of life. So the money which is being made with that data is in the end in favor, used in favor of a public health insurance then it wouldn't be, we wouldn't, the money wouldn't be taken away from us. 
Well, this sounds wonderful. I mean, I mean, look, I love this idea. I mean, this idea of a global health insurance where you're giving your code, your privacy, your, your all the system, all the things that are going on, whether that's with nano robots or whether that's with, you know, just a swab of, you know, one's DNA sequence and, and then allowing the government to track us for the betterment of our own health. And that money would then, I mean, it's taxation. I mean, it really, it's, this, it's the social contract when, when one is taxed. I mean, we, we pay taxes with this idea that our, the government will, the police will be there, that we're educated, that the roads are clear and, and so on and so forth. So in this case, we're, we'd be paying some sort of a tax, what we call it a tax, some sort of a fee. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and on the way out, we're getting health insurance that covers all of these things. For that. That's, I mean, that's it sounds wonderful. And so what we need to make sure, on the other hand, is sort of obviously if the data is being, the digital data needs to be stored somewhere. And whenever humans have access to the data, it's, there's a risk of it being used against us for some kind of also illegitimate sanction. So we need to protect the data, our data, in a safe manner. It only gets used in order to find out sort of correlations between genes and diseases between all the information which are necessary for promoting our health spans, for political decision-making, for innovations. Um, but it needs to be stored safely and only in the case of emergencies, humans have access. Otherwise, it needs to be primarily processed by AIs. Um, and this is the way to reduce that illegit the illegit uh, illegitimate use of these data um, that, that we use, we humans get, get sort of... Um, that we humans get forced into ways of doing in any kind of illegitimate use is used by the is reduced by the use of AI for processing the data. And at the no. same time, and, and the second step, just a, a, a second thought of which I think is essential. Um, at the same time, it, we also need to guarantee um, we need to open up, open up and focus on freedom much further than we do. So that um, if we have access to the data that we don't get sanctioned, you know, for something where no harm is directly done to another person. So plurality needs to be promoted much further than we have it at the moment. And that in this way, we don't have to fear the sanctions which go along with the collection of the digital data. So on the one hand, using the data to pay for something which is in our interest, paying for public health insurance, in the second way, we promote plurality much further so that we don't have to fear the sanctions. And in that way, um, the government, some kind of government can, can collect the data and, but also needs to be stored properly and safely. Look, I love these ideas. I mean, these ideas are wonderful. I mean, I just, you know, having now lived in the United States for a long time and, and seeing the immense contradictions that, that there are here with freedom and yet yeah, and rights and and the aspirations of the united states versus the practical day-to-day -day of how everybody lives but particularly those people in in minorities or in minorities for right now so i mean but but i the discussion here is so crazy in and around this all you have to do is go on twitter or reddit and and, and look at some of these like Ideas, the ideas that, that, that we would trust a government, that the conspiracy theories sort of blow up. And some of these conspiracies are in sort of this, you know, the transhuman hub in terms of giving away. I mean, I, I agree with you that there doesn't have to be a conflict between this if there is this system, but the idea of getting to this system in this fractured political, certainly because I'm no longer in Europe, you know, so I don't see it as much, but I see it here, seems, very much like a pipe dream. Do you, what's, how do we get there? I mean, that's... It, it's not so easy. In the, in the US in particular, we've got a very libertarian system. And that's why sort of the companies um, have the right also to, to collect the data. And it's in their interest to keep that libertarian system as open as it is. So I think the first step would have to occur in, in Europe. And here in Europe, I, I think, we necessarily have to rethink the meaning of digital data because as the system is right now, in a, in a couple of years at least, one will realize in Europe that together with a collection of data, um, there, is, there is power, there's economic flourishing. So Europe will end up 
being the Disney world, Disneyland of the world. Europe will end up being the Disneyland of the world. Tourists will come here just because we've got Neuschwanstein, we've got the Colosseum, we've got the pizzas, and we've got some delicious local foods, um, but not for economic and scientific reasons. So unless we change that attitude, unless we recognize the importance also, the pragmatic importance of collecting the data, um, and then, then there will be a need to rethink and to give up on the privacy. So here, we would have to have the first step, have a government establish something, um, a, a safe way of collecting the data, of storing, of processing the data. And if it works here, you know, then we can expand the ideas further and implement it in, in other, per, other parts you, of the world. Do you think that, 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 Europe, that Europe is ready? I mean, you're talking about like a, a, the, a sort of a European Union type yeah. sort of plan. I mean, are, are people ready? Are, are people, I mean, I guess one could say that if there's any sort of silver lining of COVID that, that they may have to be ready. I mean, okay. I guess, but is that your sense? Well, so far, Europe is not ready. Europe neither has the digital infrastructure um, nor do they have the appropriateness to embrace these emerging technologies. It's, it's so extremely conservative in Europe that really it makes me, it, it makes me get scared whenever I hear the responses in the audience giving my presentations. Um, but I think um, people will eventually have to rethink this issue and they will do so when they realize, well, basically we're really on the way down. They'll, they'll be, I mean, economically, um, China will be flourishing. And I don't see any way of, of trying to escape that for the time being. Who should stop China? Because it's, it's, digital data is connected with so much information, with so much power, and, and they have the most efficient means of basically generating, uh, generating the information. They are the only place where, who's got sort of the legal power to get the digital data from all citizens in, in the country. And not even the US has got that mean, has got these possibilities. And what also needs to be a rethought is that we are right now in a, in, a, in a war for digital data. And the internet is no longer a global uh, institution because um, digital data have, have become local. Localization is a new process which we need to take seriously. And that's What does because, that mean? What is um, localization? localization it's be besides globalization, there's a tendency towards localization. Oh, localization. Okay, yeah, local. So localization, that's sort of the com. It's actually, it originates from a Japanese term, and which is already a couple of decades ago, localization as, a, as a, when the con concept of localization was formed. But it now plays a particularly important role uh, when it comes to the war concerning digital data. Because what we see is, what happens in China, they don't only have the wall of China, but they also got the, the digital firewall. So only companies which subscribe to the rules of the Chinese government have got the rights to be used in, in China. Otherwise, it's only the government who's got the right to collect all the data. I mean, that's but the data Facebook only has that. That's why Facebook and Google can't enter there. Um, on the other hand, with Huawei, they've got the company which basically has the possibility of collecting the data in the rest of the world. And, and the German government is so stupid that they, I mean, even consider um, in, uh, using or um, having Huawei in, in creating the 5G infrastructure in Germany, which I think is, is outrageous because they're giving up what is mostly in their interest, namely the access to the digital data. But will they get access with this deal? Do that, do, do, does the German government also get access to that thing? I mean, if, if Huawei is responsible for creating the infrastructure, and then it's easy simply to, to implement some technologies in order to make the things, you know, go flow, flow to it. But I mean, part of it's about trend. Yeah. But part of the question, and this is part of the, I think part of the problem is a question of transparency. I mean, we don't trust because even now when you said you don't know, like, oh, we'll do this, we'll do this. I mean, I think that's part of the problem is, is we don't trust and why these conspiracy theories flourish. And look, there may be some truth to some of them, particularly, you know, in countries like China where, you know, they can do whatever they want. 
but but I mean they flourish because we don't have we we're not given the information. It's like oh they come in they'll they'll give the in the German infrastructure and there may be these systems. Do you know what I mean? Like I think we've either got, got I I think we want our governments to make good decisions and 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 then when they don't or when we think they don't it's very sort of top line rather than like okay let's have a debate do we want china to come in do we want how does how does this work right i mean i think that's part of the issue well, let me ask you a question that relates to something that you'd said earlier when did you first come across fm fm in in your transhuman journey and what was your sense of how is he part of the mix. I mean, he doesn't strike me as sort of a neat, you know, a sort of a Nietzschean um, der derivation, <laughs> but maybe. He crossed very early on um, that there's a radical paradigm shift which goes along with the use of these new technologies. It's not just, not just the benefits we have as a consequence of using them, but it's a new way of rethinking what does it mean to be a family, what does it, like the institution of marriage, the, the, the meaning of reproduction, everything needs to be rethought because of the news of new technologies. And that's what, what I thought is, is particularly important to realize. And that's why many people are like Fukuyama thought, uh, transhumanism is the world's most dangerous idea because it's really a paradigm shift away from our traditional Christian humanist understanding where the human being has a special status in the world and there's like a, a natural family, a man and a woman having, having offspring by means of sexual reproduction. But we are moving radically away from that. Now well, except, been... except that humans now, you're still, I mean, the one thing that remains, I think in, in most strands of transhumanism is this, the primacy of man is that we're at the top of the pyramid. I mean, there's some, there's some, there's some breakaways. This is actually quite an interesting question, because if you look at some of the initiatives of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, um, which was founded by, by Bostrom and, and James Hughes, and many transhumanists are part of that institution, um, they have initialized projects on personhood for non-human animals. And this is already sort of that shift away. It's not just humans. We need to consider other types of animals as well. And so it's maybe, and what remains from my perspective at least, well, yeah, there is a difference. We still focus on personhood, but personhood can also apply to, to chimpanzees, to dolphins. And so it's an opening up um, of the traditional concept, and that's part of part of the shift away from our traditional humanist understanding. So, and, and, and many people do subscribe to that. There are still there are transhumanists who um, most focus on on reason and have the primacy in, in in human beings. But I don't think this is necessarily the most plausible take on transhumanism, um, because um, many transhumanists subscribe to. Um, an atheist, a skeptic, a naturalist understanding. There are surveys which shows like more than 90% have, have such, a, um, such an understanding of the world. And once you have a, a naturalist way of understanding the world, then it's, it's really difficult to uphold an anthropocentric perspective because then you need to worry, you know, what is really morally relevant? And we come up with the notion, well, actually, what is morally relevant is, is probably suffering. And the more intense you suffer, the more intensely you suffer, the more moral weight should be attributed to you. And here we've got, we, we, we do end up in a, in a, in a sort of hierarchy and, and we've got like personhood and coming first. But the intensity of suffering is something which can be, um, which not only applies to adult humans, but also to, to elephants and dolphins and chimpanzees. And also, in principle, also to sufficiently developed AIs, um, to AIs with the appropriate sensors. Current AIs do not have the capacity to do so yet, but there are reasons why something, a capacity like, like cognitive suffering is something which AIs can, in, in principle, experience too. And 
by in this way, I think suffering becomes a new 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 focal point, which is no longer the humanistic anthropocentric um, basic which we used to have in the Christian tradition. We I don't know that we actually talked about the challenges. I think we sort of went straight in, or I did went straight into COVID. Like I said to you, that the biggest challenge that you seem to focus on was the death, was death, mind uploading, and and so on. What are some of the other big challenges that you think um, that we face? I mean. Because it sounds to me like you're saying this is not a question of will or a question of is the technology there? It may not be there fully and fully developed. So, well, one number, one number one, what are the challenges or problems? And then how in your sort of philosophy or, or approach will we solve these problems other than death and, and COVID? Aging in particular is such a central issue because this is being shared by most human beings. Most beings see aging you know, as a challenge. An expanded health span would improve the quality of life for most human beings. That's why aging really is the central issue. And with Aubrey de Cray's approaches and, 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 and the possibilities in particular which go along with genome editing, we are really on a good path on, on successfully dealing with, with many of them. That's one aspect which applies to many persons. The other aspect which I'm particularly interested in is, is, is sort of the plurality of different uses. Because I think it's negative freedom, the absence of constraint is, is a wonderful achievement. We all can live according to our own understanding of what it means to live a good life. We are no longer being told by religious leaders, by political leaders, this is what we should do. But as long as you don't harm another person, you should be free to do whatever you want to do. And that implies, you know, suggestions like, well, like incest among consenting adults should be legal. It's, for, it's illegal in Germany, but it's legal in Spain already because you're not harming anyone. So whenever you do anything where no direct harm is doing, being done to another person, that should be legal. And that increases the plurality of our, of our flourishing. And then people can use these technologies in order just to promote their own idiosyncratic way of what they regard as, as worthy of being alive. And there's, you know, we have as many understandings of what we want to do as there are human beings. There are only very few things which many people there share. Only like expanding the health spans is one of the few issues. You know, other things many people see like cognitive advance, intelligence, but they're much fewer people than, than, um, than the ones who share, um, uh, share health as a, as a problem. But otherwise, you know, some people would want to have um, a, a skin which enables them to do photosynthesis. And I've got friends, a scientist, who already managed to do genome editing at a zebra fish. And as a consequence, he created a zebra fish who turns, who turns um, green in the end and who gets 20% of its nourishment as a consequence of photosynthesis. Um, so if it works in, in zebra fish, it should also work in human beings. And yeah, then we will turn green and we've got the possibility to gain nourishment even if we are on a, on a flight to Mars. And you see, um, but there are many different people and many people have different goals and we should allow, allow them to use these. I wanna see the plurality of human flourishing. And this is unfortunately in our traditional in our traditional Christian humanist understanding, it's still so many, so many, so many limitations. Even though no one gets harmed, we are still not allowed to use technologies in order to realize our goals. And we need to get rid of these encrusted structures and see the flourishing of the you know great multiplicity of flourishing of all human beings and other just, persons. Well, let me ask you about this the goal. And I'm not I'm not um I'm not suggesting that it isn't a positive goal. I mean, freedom, what a, what a great goal. I mean, the, 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 to me, the, the questions are one, I think the most sort of fraught question is how do you define harm? Because we've seen this in our human history. I mean, there are unintended consequences for uses of various technologies or just, just specific, we intend to, we're gonna go and invade Denmark because blah, and we're gonna help the, you know, and then there are unintended consequences to most human actions and endeavors, especially large ones. So there is this question of how do we, how do we 
think about harm, what does that mean, who do we look at, society, the individuals, and then there's the question of, well, how do we regulate, how do we actually, if, I mean, because I don't think you're saying no constraints, whatever, because... No, that, that doesn't work, obviously, yeah. No, I mean, we need, there are, we need limits, I mean, of I think... Course. You, we need if the, someone so hurts we, another person, then that's a clear harm and the person needs to be put in prison. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, where, when the prisons of the future, are they like the Superman one where they get in the, they're, they're in that sort of cryo tube and they're like, you know, in some, 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 no, I mean, but I, I'm, I'm serious. I mean, like how the, this idea of, I mean, there are so many and I could, we could, we could talk some through if you want, but I mean, where you know, so-and-so says, okay, well, I want to have this colony where well, they're going to do this. And one could argue, well, this is their little colony and they could do what they want. But this, this creature that they've created to have fun with, you know, is, 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 isn't, hasn't signed on. And now they have the cognitive ability that's the, the same one that you describe in these AIs. So they feel that they are harmed. I mean, so these questions, I don't know that they're so binary. It's like, oh, I can do whatever I want. I'm not going to harm somebody. Oh, but... So I think that needs a little bit more, that, that part of it needs a little bit more thought, but it really is like, so you've got this question of what's harm in this future, and then how do we regulate the various companies that, that are offering this to us or are developing these things? Because as you said, the, the, the US libertarian system, you know, has, you know, there are inbuilt, aspects that are going to not benefit the you know us as individuals they're going to they're going to benefit the company and we don't i don't think that any of us want to be living under this sort of google facebook sort of conglomerate either if that's the choice between china or google facebook sort of i'm not sure which i which i prefer that's why we need the middle ground which i'm suggesting. yeah i think we both i agree with you the, the, the harm issue is really that's a tricky one um, and I, there's no proper answer. There's no generally uh, applicable answer to that. Because obviously, um, in a country like Germany, we need to think about some issues differently than we do in a, in a country like Iceland. I mean, there was, for example, um, the question of prohibit, prohibiting male circumcision. And that definitely has a different ring in Germany than it does in Iceland. In, in Germany, that couldn't be turned into a law because of the sort of the religious implication. It prevents Jewish and Muslim life to occur. And that's why, you know, even it could, it could, you could argue that male circumcision is an illegitimate type of harm. Um, because of the German history, it's impossible, you know, to seriously discuss it and to implement it in, in legal circumstances. Another country which doesn't have that specific um, cultural background you know, might have much less hesitation on thinking about and considering the implications of, of, of that specific issue. And so uh, further thing is um, in particular, and that's, that uh, applies to the beginning of life issues. So what constitutes harm? Can there be harm if there is no brain? Can there be harm if there is no nervous system? If there is no brain and no nervous system, how can the entity suffer at all? And the brain development in human beings only starts- Do you, you say pain? Is it pain? pain yeah, pain, yeah. sorry. Um, the, the, the pain experience, you need to have a nervous system and you need, to have, you, you need to have a sufficiently developed brain. In the first three weeks of the human development, there was not even any, there is no brain at all because the brain only starts developing three weeks after fertilization. And so why should that entity be granted any moral status? Why should that entity be considered morally at all? Um, and that, that already opens up a lot of possibilities concerning, you know, um, concerning pre-implantation genetic diagnosis on concerning selecting embryos, concerning making research on embryonic stem cells. And, and so this is why it's so important to reflect upon the issue of harm. And in, in Germany, it's still the case because of that particular historic past um, um, that one takes a very um, cautious attitude and that one, um, that basically even abortion is illegal. Abortion in most cases is illegal in Germany. 
the I only solution, that. well, sort of the practical solution, it is, it is illegal, but you don't get punished for it. But as a oh. consequence, again, of the same implementation, uh, of the same regulation as, as, as basically stem, stem cell research is illegal in Germany as well. The only way now they trying to justify it, well, it is, it is legal if you import stem cells who, who are the result, you know, from other countries um, and to, who were created at a, certain, uh, at a certain point long time in the past. What does that mean? Well, normally, um, normally an embryonic stem cell counts as a human being, counts as a person, but if, if it was imported, if it's a, if it's a foreigner, then you do research on it. That's an absolutely, you know, that's the nonsensical legal basis. And we need to get things straight. It's absolutely, you know, once suffering is morally central, there's no good reason why stem cell research shouldn't be legitimate because there's no way these entities can suffer. And, and once that's, that's why the sort of the paradigm shift concerning how we conceptualize human beings is, is such a fundamental way of rethinking who we are with respect to the world. Because basically the entire Western tradition has inherited that understanding that we have that special status. Only we have the divine spark in us. And because we have got the divine spark, we must not play around. We mustn't do any you know, genetic modification. We mustn't do abortions. We mustn't do embryonic stem cell research. But once we re realize we as humans are just a result of, of evolutionary processes, we, we, we don't have that special status. We are just gradually different from all the other animals. Then, then this is shifting also our perception on, on what may be done with other entities. And, um, and at the beginning of life. And that opens up the entire uh, realm of possibilities which have to do with gene technologies, uh, which is extremely fascinating, um, particularly as a consequence of the CRISPR-Cas9 and the entire range of genome medicine technologies. I mean, it, it's, it's so interesting. And yet, you know, I mean, in terms of the questions and people's resistance, and you probably see this a lot, like in your talks and so on, when you talk about this idea of genetic manipulation, particularly in human beings, what is the reaction? Because I, 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 most of the discussions I've had is, oh, we shouldn't do that. No, we shouldn't do that. The, the, this is precious. And, I'm, I, and I say, and I had this discussion with my son, actually, I'm like, but hold on a minute. Like, if, you know, we were able to see that there was some congenital heart defect, like, you know, if, you know we would solve that. We would fix that. Is that a problem? No. Okay, well, why is, okay, if I want you to, you know, be, wanted this baby to be more intelligent or faster, well, how is that any different? And that's, you know, we have a resistance. Tell me about some of the sort of um, resistance that you've encountered and how you talk through. Have you, I don't want to say win because that, that sounds too competitive, but, but how have you <laughs> managed to get some shift in terms of these discussions? And is, so, your, is your experience similar to mine or is it different? The responses depend on where you are in the world. In, in Europe, the general response is a hesitant one. I, I'm very often actually in Eastern Asia and here, here the responses are radically different. And, and one example could be actually, um, uh, there was a, a friend of mine who's part of the Real Vegan Cheese Project. He was, you know, a 15 year old guy when we were there. He, and he played around with, you know, with CRISPR and he managed to change the yeast in order to taint, uh, turn it into lactose. And he used the lactose in order to create real vegan cheese. If you look up Real Vegan Cheese, you, you'll find the project. And he did that at the age of 50. And the people in the audience basically responded in, 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 in Taipei where we met. Uh, the, the people in the audience responded, that's wonderful, you're a genius. I mean, can you have, you know, can you give me an autograph? You're just like a groundbreaking visionary. And the people loved it. And because it's a wonderful idea in order to show sort of the green ideas and technologies, there doesn't have to be a conflict. Actually, the green ideas and sustainable ideas can, can, can be realized best on the basis of emerging technologies. If I tell the same story in, in the European context, 
then basically the response I get, well, the little boy didn't have any, any use. He should better play around with a, with a you know, drum and run around the Christmas tree. And you know, that's like, that's a risk of destroying humanity. And the, the general response is what, what he's doing or what people are doing when they use genetic modification, they are playing God. It undermines our religious self-understanding. That's one of the central areas. And the other central area comes rather from the left. And they say, well, it's, it's a worry of, of like um, creating a more hierarchical society. But that doesn't have to be the case either. That's a very, that's actually a very German take on the German creams have that take. There's a, needs to, has to be a conflict between between technology and cream thinking, be, um, because um, because it does because of the social consequences, because a new hierarchy gets created. I've got different friends in in France and Belgium who are members of the Green Party who actually re properly realize no proper cream goals can only be realized if they use the latest technology. And in recent, in the recent years, I actually got a lot of invitations from, from Christian and in particular from Catholic institutions. And I, I was part of the Catholic state that only occurs every, every three years. It's like where thousands and thousands, sometimes the Pope comes, you know, Catholics unite in order to reinforce their beliefs. And I was even warned by the organizers, you know, me showing up might be sufficient for, you know, the, the reactions might be a bit harsh and I shouldn't, you know, I, I need to be careful. That's what I was told in advance. And then sort of my opponent, um, my co-discussant was a, an emeritus professor of theology, but also a PhD in biology. And, and he attacked me. He, he wrapped my stuff before we had the discussion. Actually, the room was packed, 200 people waiting outside they, they were not allowed to get in because of, you know, fire protection, safety reasons. I and mean, there was an enormous interest in, in these issues. Um, and then um, in, 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 in not, I was not responding in, in, a, in a ferocious way or in violent, aggressive way. Well, he was acting, you know, as if I was devil, you know, Mephistopheles personally showing up. Um, <laughs> well, on the other hand, I was merely trying to show actually no, just we need to rethink the meaning of what we, you know, what these technologies are for, and just by focusing on the Bible, you can see the the, the parable of the talents. So God gave talents to these um, two brothers, and one of the brothers hit the talents in the in the earth, was not using them. The other one was using them and and it was flourishing. And the one who was rewarded in the end was the one who, who used the talents and, and multiplied them. And, and clearly our capacities of using these technologies are our talents. So even, even on the basis of the Bible, we've got an obligation. So did, they, did they respond talents. to you to, the, to, and, to this part? Was, and, he, was that the, helpful? That was extremely helpful. And, and no, but the did people, they, they shift a bit when, when, you, when you talked about that? The people, the people, I mean, I added further examples because, I mean, so far we've got an average life expectancy of 80 years, but look at, read the Bible and you'll see, find a lot of 120 years old or even Methuselah who's even older. And, and so if you see that, so even it, you know, it clearly was God's will that we, we don't die at the age of 80, give us at least 40 more years. And, you know, this is a very good justification by reference to the Bible. And, you know, people try to rethink, realize, no, there is more to it. And you can tell further stories. And further stories, actually, they have to do with, you know, what do we understand as technology? Technology is not just something alien to us. Actually, we get upgraded just after we were born. We don't have to wait to communicate. We don't have language. Our parents upgrade us with, with language. It's, it's our first upgrade. And, and then we, we go to school. That's a permanent process of technological upgrading. And, um, well, it depends where you went to school. No, I was trying to make a joke. That was a joke. <laughs> that was a joke. Sorry. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I mean, sort of any... It, so entire schooling education system is, is a permanent technological upgrade. Language is already a technology. 
and we've got a, a, a legal and moral obligation to go to school and to get upgraded. And this is the best way to rethink um, the current technologies. It's not something radical in you, categorical in you. It's just a gradual shift. It's something we, what we've always been doing, we've been using new technologies, developing new ones to, to create more flourishing lives. And, and by rethinking that, understanding the importance, uh, you know, how terrible it is, you know, that we all fade away, we get older, hair is getting gray, wrinkles appear, we suffer. You know, our parents die, our loved ones die. And this is like, it's, it's just a couple of decades we stayed together with them. And, and now we, we, we've got the technologies to develop that, to expand that much further. And um, so this is, it must be clear and it becomes clear for more and more people that this really needs to become an important political issue. So more, more money should be invested also politically in promoting anti-aging research and research which promotes an expanded health span. Do you think that's going to happen? It's already happening. I mean, no, I mean, do you think it's going to happen in this way where governments, I mean, to say, well, I mean, from on a government, but I mean, I know that investment in these sorts of, but from, I guess, from a, a nationalistic or an international perspective is what I'm asking you. Do you see that happening? Where governments are getting behind this? We, we, we already see, I mean, the way things are structured, who invests, um, it, it really depends very much on the culture you live in. I mean, it's, it's much more, uh, of a private investment in the US, many things, so university funding is much, you know, there's more significant university funding, many inventions rather take place in the European Union. Things, now we see China, uh, and, and there everything's um, basically funded, supported by the government. Well, yeah. <laughs> here, and here, I mean, have a look at that. If you look at the peer reviewed papers, China has already overtaken the United States. They've got more scientific articles being published in peer-reviewed papers than the US. And this is only the beginning. This is a country which focuses on these new technologies, which 50, 60 years ago was like one of the poorest states in the world. And we see a similar progression actually in Korea. South Korea was, was poorer than North Korea 60, 70 years ago. Now it's again, a very flourishing, promising country. And we, because we realize the importance also the economical importance which goes along with these, uh, with the new technologies. But yeah, but, but, but China is just one example without like, obviously I'm not defending, you know, this, um, the political system as we have it in China. But it, well, let me, but, I mean, but this brings up a really big question that I hadn't even thought about. I mean, in, so, uh, as, you, as, as one forecasts into the future and thinks about what's going on and, and like, if you play it out, like China is, you know, in effect, like as you've described, and I agree with you on the whole, doing a lot of the right things. I mean, in terms of this, like, how do we get to a place where China has achieved all of this, and yet we we need this more cohesive world? And we've got China, who is, you know, communist or dictatorial country. Who, you know, how does how does that where and then the West, who's sort of fallen behind because it hasn't done this? I mean, that seems both fraught with conflict, but you know, in your, in this trajectory of things, we, you obviously, well not obviously, but I want this to pan out so that we're not in this sort of Chinese system and we're not in this, how does that resolve itself? You, you, you're right in pointing out that is a central conflict of the future. Chinese as a consequence of that cohesive way of structuring society, of that relational way of having an author, authoritarian, you know, a state where they can basically collect all the digital data they focus on digital innovation, they focus on gene innovation, they make a lot of clever decisions and, and um, that leads to financial and economic flourishing. And I mean, so far still Europe is doing fine with, you know, with engineering and obviously the, the, the private solutions as they are in place in the, in the US, they work extremely well still. However, once we need to realize the digital data becoming more and more important because not only for political decision makings, for scientific innovations, just for, for, for new creations. And the ones who have the data and the ones who have the rights to collect all the different data, they probably have the most, most important and most efficient means for creating something new 
uh, for generating economic flourishing. So yeah, the Chinese are doing a lot of you know a, a, a lot of right and 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 but obviously I'm not in favor of of that kind of uh, um, governmental structure. I think negative freedom and democracy, a liberal democracy, is is a wonderful achievement, something which we need to cherish. Um, so. Um, but realizing the economic gain which goes along with such, such a political organization will have to make us rethink the meaning of digital data and how we want to structure our society. And, and it, it will have to come as a, as a necessity, sort of in the end it goes along with, with when, when there's a financial decline in a country, what happens next is usually scapegoats are needed. The, you know, the citizens look for scapegoats. When it concerns the middle class, they will think, no, it's the others. It's the minority recruits. It's the refugees, the ones who think differently. And that will lead to conflict within the society. And the conflict in society, you know, the stronger the conflict gets, that will end up in a civil war. And so that shows, no, at least at that stage, hopefully much earlier, will come to the solution, a new way of organizing a society is needed. And we need to, well, in that case, um, yeah, we need to find a democratic usage of our digital data. And as a consequence, the government needs to collect it. Um, but the government needs to be one, uh, uh, um, um, the government needs to be such that we trust in it, that it, it gets stored safely that it's not being used against the people, that it doesn't undermine the plurality of human flourishing. But that's in the end something which we as the citizens need to fight for. We need to create something which is in our interest, not in the interest of the big companies or not in the interest of a, of a, of a very communist um, arrangement of a political system. And in the end, it's, it's up to us um, to rethink that and to fight for it in the same way as it's taken place during the Enlightenment. It was not just the, you know, the masses of the people. It was like the philosophers, the engineers, the scientists. On various levels, people have been fighting for the right to live according to their idiosyncratic understanding, uh, idiosyncratic way of living. And because I don't want to be told anymore by political and religious leader how I should lead my life. I want to have the right to realize my own understanding of the good life. And that's such a wonderful understanding. But of course, we also need the economic well-being. And that's why we need to take seriously um, the, the, um, the relevance of digital data. And that's why we need to use the financial gain benefit from, from the big data in a, in a democratic web manner. I love that idea. This is, I guess this is my sort of last question for you because it's a fun, I think it's a fun question. So if you could upload your consciousness, mind uploading, which is where you're, you're, you're at the sort of bastion of, of, of transhuman thought, what would the environment or the, how would, and, and you could design it or, or ask for certain things in your, um, in your contract with whoever's gonna reanimate you, what would that environment look like? What would it be like? What could you do? Tell me a little bit about that. <laughs> You're trying to get to my fantasy. But yeah, I'm why not? I mean, like, we're, this, we're has been very, this, this has been <laughs> very G-rated. We want X-rated, you know, so we've we got, we got to get that audience. So, yeah. But you, you don't want to get censored. If I told you the, either you or I would get censored. We are not living in a sufficiently pluralistic society yet that I could tell you my fantasy. Uh, well, give me sort of the be the bare bones upload, you know, the, the one that you'd be you, you're you're discussing with um, children students. If we can give you, you can give me the sort of middle ground version. No, I, I do think. I mean, my own personal idea. It, it, I'm very much connected to, to to myself, and I'm aware that other people have their very own take on the, on on these issues. And I, I want to live actually in a society. I want to be in a society where I have these where I can see people living according to their very own way of living, to, 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 to realize their erotic go uh, goals, to live in a society, obviously, with, you know, as little, you know, a long health span, that we can, you know, we can have a good time and eat and drink and stay slim 
and be healthy <laughs> for a long time and live according to our most most exciting erotic desires obviously that would be amazing and to see others do the same as long as no no other person gets done harm to directly and that's very important we need, always need to take the others others wishes into uh, into consideration and one shouldn't abuse them and and because once that occurs this is this is there's a violence and and there's suffering connected to it which i think which i don't want to see i don't want to live in such a society and i don't want other people to do that to me and and that's abs that's abs very important to me because very often just people come up to you uh, up you know to me and say you shouldn't do this because it just doesn't look good or you should but there's not a good reason for doing so um because no no one else gets harmed by that and 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 i hate that and and many people do so but but there is still such a widely shared tendency of universalizing your own understanding of what the world should look like and this is uh, something I find really, really, really terrible. You shouldn't universalize your own prejudices concerning values. You should, you know, want to live, express others the way they want to live and do so yourself. Yeah, that, that'd be lovely. Thank you so much. It's been fun. Thank you. I really appreciate Thanks it. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it was and my well, pleasure. If, if you're in New York or, or, or thing, it'd be nice to meet you.